Welcome to this movie on classical mechanics. Uh, I have made a series of movie, in fact, on the uh, Lagrange and Hamilton formalism in classical mechanics, and I have made those for my students in the second year of classical mechanics at the Delft University of Technology. My name is Jos Thijssen, and I hope you enjoy the movie and uh, learn how to apply Lagrange formalism to a problem of a pendulum between two springs. So the problem I wish to consider is a uh, problem where we have two masses. There is a small m and there is a capital M. And these two masses, they uh, can move. Uh, the m, the little m, can only move in the horizontal direction. So this guy cannot move in the vertical direction. And there is also a constraint on the motion of capital M because this is a rigid rod with a fixed length L, so it forms a pendulum with respect to this M. So imagine that this mass can move in the horizontal direction and this one can at the same time swing. So that's uh, quite a complicated problem and we shall see how to analyze this in uh, using a Lagrangian. And uh, the problems, uh, if we want to attack such a problem, it always proceeds in a, in, in a series of steps. So first is um, identify the number and the, the character of the degrees of freedom. And for each degree of freedom we choose an appropriate generalized coordinate. Then we write up the kinetic energy first, T kinetic energy and we calculate the potential energy and we do both in terms of the generalized coordinates and we can write up the Lagrangian which is T minus V and finally we have to solve the Lagrange equations and they read d d t d l d q j dot equals d l d q j and the q j and the q j dot are the generalized coordinates that we have identified in step one so for this particular problem we have uh, enough constraints to reduce the number of degrees of freedom. Well, I didn't mention that yet, but the uh, pendulum here is obliged to move only in the plane. So it has only one degree of freedom, which is this angle with respect to the vertical, and we call that angle phi. And we also have the horizontal displacement of this mass m, and in order to uh, avoid confusion with the later use of x. We do, do not call it x, but we use it, we call it psi. So we have in fact two generalized coordinates, and they are the psi and the phi. And so that completes step one. We have chosen the generalized coordinates, and so the next step is to calculate the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is the kinetic energy, first of all, of the small mass, and so that's m over 2 and the small mass displaced displaces with a coordinate xi so here we just have a xi dot squared now the second one is a little bit more complicated that's the displacement of m because m will not only displace because phi changes but it also displaces because m is changing so the suspension point of the pendulum will change and so let us uh, write up the Cartesian coordinates of the second mass we have x and that's psi that's the displacement of the suspension point or the displacement of the little m and we have a horizontal displacement which is given by L sine phi And the y component is xi, uh, sorry, that's a zero, that's just L cosine phi. 
and here we choose the y in the negative vertical direction. Okay, having these two, it's possible to calculate the velocity, so x dot is xi dot plus L is a constant, and so we have to take the time derivative uh, with respect to phi here, derivative of sine phi is cosine phi, and then we have to multiply by phi dot. And similar for the y, we have minus L sine phi phi dot. And so for the mass capital M, we have that the M over 2 times V squared is M over 2. The velocity squared is x dot squared plus y dot squared, and so we first have the xi dot plus L cosine phi phi dot squared plus the L squared sine squared phi phi dot squared and if we work out this we have first of all the xi dot squared plus a 2 xi dot phi dot L cosine phi and the last term of this one combines together with that one using cosine squared plus sine squared is 1 to L squared phi dot squared and so we can fill that in here we obtain capital M over 2 xi dot squared plus 2 xi dot phi dot L cosine phi plus L squared phi dot squared so this is the kinetic energy and let's move it towards the bottom and then we continue with the potential energy now if you look at the picture there are two contributions to the potential energy first of all we have these two springs and when the mass displaces uh, over a distance then this spring is for example if it goes to the right if it moves towards the right then this spring is compressed and this one is stretched so we have the double amount of energy of a single spring and moreover if the pendulum moves uh, the capital M will go up and down and that changes the gravitational energy so let us write up the potential energy So first of all, we have um, kappa times xi squared, because xi is the displacement. For a single spring, we would have a half kappa xi squared, but we have two springs, and hence we have kappa xi squared. And then, for the uh, pendulum, we have to consider the y-coordinate. And that gives me a minus capital M times L times G times cosine phi. And the quick way for checking this sign is that for phi is zero, the pendulum hangs vertically, and then that should correspond to the minimum of the potential, which indeed is the case if we take a minus sign there. All right, so let's write up the L, which is T minus V. And for that L, we can write up the Lagrange equations, and there are two of them, uh, each uh, corresponding to one generalized coordinates, and we have two generalized coordinates, Xi and Phi. So we start by the equation for Xi. So we obtain d dt dl 
the xi dot. That's the left hand, and it should be equal to dl the xi. So let us fill in these terms. This gives me a ddt, and the xi dot is present in the kinetic energy. It occurs here, here, and there. So we have three terms. The first term gives me an m xi dot. The second one gives me a capital M xi dot. And the third term gives me a, now if the xi dot drops out here, we have an M times an L times a phi dot times cosine phi. And on the right hand side, we have the L d xi. And the L d xi, there is a uh, xi and xi dot are considered to be independent variables. There is only one xi here. So I obtain a 2 minus 2 kappa xi. The minus sign is because V occurs with a minus sign in L. So that's my equation for xi. Now what we uh, still should do is work out this time derivative and for the first two terms that's simple. We have an M plus a capital M times a xi dot dot and here we have two contributions, one from the phi dot, which gives me an AML phi dot dot, cosine phi, but also this phi is time dependent, and so we get a second term, the derivative of the cosine is minus the sine, so we get a minus L M, and then there is a phi dot squared because there was already a phi dot and there is a second one coming from this time derivative and there is a sign phi. And so this should be equal to minus 2k kappa xi. And that is my first Lagrange equation. So now on to the second equation, which is the equation for phi. And so we start by evaluating the derivative of L with respect to phi dot. And there are two contributions, one deriving from this term and one deriving from that. And so let us uh, write up those two contributions. The first one gives me an M times xi dot times L times cosine phi. And the second contribution is also proportional to capital M and it gives me an L squared phi dot. And so on the right hand side we get a dl d phi and I get two contributions to that. There is a phi in the kinetic energy and there is a phi in the potential energy. Now the potential energy occurs with the minus sign so we have a plus cosine phi but the derivative of cosine with respect to phi is minus the sign so we have a minus m g l sine phi. And then we have a contribution from the kinetic energy and that contribution gives me a minus m l xi dot phi dot sine phi. So this is dl d phi. Then we work out the left hand side of this equation and so we obtain m. First we have xi dot dot l cosine phi but then we have to take the derivative with respect to this phi so we have minus m xi dot phi dot l sine phi and we have plus an m l squared phi dot dot and on the right hand side we have these two terms which I can lump together with a minus sign in front of them uh, so here we have a g and we have plus an xi dot 
phi dot and then we have a sine phi. So this is my second Lagrange equation for the pendulum between two springs. We see that these two equations are rather complicated and it seems that it's difficult to make sense out of them. Well, one thing we could do, of course, is putting them into a computer. But we can also evaluate the solution in a certain limit. And that will be part of a later movie, which is on uh, normal modes, where we will come back to this uh, example. I would like to point out two important issues here. The first one is that it's easy to overlook the coupling between the xi and the phi, so this term with xi dot times phi dot, that's easily overlooked, and you should really look careful, carefully at the position of the pendulum in order to, to, to obtain that term. Uh, a second issue is that uh, you should always be very careful in working out the Lagrange equations to look at all the uh, dependencies, like, uh, for example, that you have a derivative with respect to dt, of this term. That is also something which is easily overlooked. Now I uh, will. Um, I have made another movie in which I consider the same problem but then in the Hamilton formalism so it is instructive to look at how you analyze this problem in the Hamilton formalism as well. And then finally there will be a movie in the future which deals with the solution of this equation uh, in the limit where the a deviation from the equilibrium is small.